best type for doing a fistula once your well versed with your doppler would be moon and your color doppler so uh, after you have done a fistula we'll be talking on maturation of the av fistula in a few slides and then we'll go on to monitoring and surveillance of the avf that is follow up and early detection of complications so let's see what are types of arteriovenous fistula you have the native ones which are most commonly practiced the atrial artery to cephalic vein the commonest uh, fistula which is done at the wrist the distal forearm or the proximal forearm the brachial artery to cephalic vein in the upper arm is also done or you have the basilic vein transposition now mind well the basilic vein is a medially placed superficial vein we'll be going to the anatomy subsequently but it's a vein which needs kind of a superficialization or a transposition because it needs to be accessed well by the uh, dialysis technologist and hence it needs some surgical mobilization as it is a deep vein so it's surgically or uh, slightly a more difficult or a challenge technique for the vascular surgeon so no, why do you do that hello yes the hide button on that uh, app dot zoom is sharing a screen yeah should i click on it yeah just click on hide okay is that yeah. fine yeah yeah fine yeah thank you okay so uh, what do you, why do you need a fistula now the hd access fistula is needed to so as to have a peripheral vascular access for conducting a hemodialysis on the dialyzer so for that you uh, the neck veins are often often used you have the hd access of central venous catheters placed but that becomes cumbersome for the patient increases the risk of your central vein thrombosis and hence a peripheral access is always preferred becomes more convenient for the patient and for the treating nephrologist so what do you exactly do is when connect an artery directly to a vein done by the vascular surgeon so as to ease this peripheral high pressure vascular access so to do that you need a kind of a evaluation which is the pre avf evaluation which includes a suitable artery is the artery suitable so you need to have a proper arterial evaluation is the vein suitable so you need to have a proper venous evaluation and of course all this goes by the aium guidelines these aium guidelines are freely available on the internet you can just type these type it and then you have entire guideline pdf downloaded and you can follow this in your day to day practice so that's what i follow it's very clear it's very very elaborate and simple to understand so what you follow normally is a non dominant arm because if you have the dominant arm chosen there are restrictions on that side the patient cannot really have his day to day activities going on fine so right hand uh, right handers who are working you know many many of the crf patients are lead an active life so the non dominant arm is always preferred complete evaluation of the brachial radial ulnar arteries as what we do in the upper limb doppler is advised look for entire b mode evaluation which includes your plaque your vessel wall calcification your luminal diameter on gray scale followed by color doppler and you do certain tests so let's go through these two tests which the artery should pass that is a modified allen test for patency of the palmar arch and the clenched fist test for reactive hyperemia so that's your upper limb uh, arterial extremity anatomy you have your brachial which does by bifurcates into your radial and your ulnar and these both these arteries have a rich palmar anastomosis which is very very important uh, as we'll see in the subsequent slides so what do you exactly do you actually look at uh, in the arterial evaluation you start looking at the brachial artery you come down you look at the radial artery as it is the best artery to be chosen for an for an access to be constructed you actually on b mode measure the b mode uh, radial artery diameter in transverse section on b mode only you switch on color and look at the for look for the homogeneous filling of the Artery, arterial lumen in the correct doppler setting for optimization of doppler signal then you have a proper evaluation of the waveform which is the multiphasic or the triphasic waveform as you expect in a peripheral artery and then you do this maneuver which i call as reactive hyperemia so from your uh, triphasic or multiphasic pattern your artery is changing to a, a monophasic pattern how does that happen let's see so what you do to elicit this response of reactive hyperemia is that you ask the patient to tightly clench his or her fist now by tightly clenching the fist you are causing a state of ischemia deliberately to see how the radial artery is responding to this you ask the patient to clench his or her fist for say a half of a minute to 1 minute and then ask the patient to release the fist 
So this release in fist is going to cause a uh, dilatation of the radial artery, and hence your flow changes from your multiphasic or triphasic flow to your monophasic flow, as you can see right on the right here on the screen when your when your uh, fist is open. So this is assessing preoperatively your artery's ability to distend because. Uh, artery which has to pump into an axis is going to bypass your capillary circulation and directly pump into the vein. So it assesses the endothelial function. This is a test for your healthy endothelium. And once this is achieved, you know enough nitrous oxide is released to have this uh, vasodilatation happening. And believe me, in these cases of CRF, you often see a uh, uh, calcified radial artery, especially these people are diabetic and hence this response can be suboptimal and this needs to be documented that even after a fist release, I'm not getting that adequate monophasic changeover. It's because of the endothelial dysfunction because of the atherosclerotic changes in the vessel wall. Okay, so this is first test which you apply that is in the arterial evaluation is your reactive hyperemia and your second test is your modified Allen's test in which what you do is you occlude the artery. Now, this is the, uh, the caudal aspect. This is your wrist end and this is your elbow end. So, the radial artery as it comes, you're going to occlude it, occlude it flow by application of uh, manual pressure by your thumb or finger. And then once you do this, you know that you have occluded the flow going distally. So, the, now the ulnar artery reacts and it gives in retrograde flow this way. So, this is here on the color Doppler image here that you can see the flow is first red. Now I'm applying pressure to occlude it and it changes to blue. So this changeover is a positive modified Allen's test, which tells you that your palmer arch is patent. So here, here it is, when you have uh, uh, occlusion of your radial artery, you have the ulnar artery supply blood in the retrograde fashion and hence the red changes into blue and vice versa. Same thing happens for the, when you compress the ulnar artery, you have your radial artery going and giving blood in the retrograde direction and this tells you that your palmer arch is patent. Okay, so that once you finish the two arterial evaluations and you know that your arteries are doing fine, you move on to the evaluation of the superficial vein, which is the cephalic vein, which is going to be your second channel or your uh, next axis, which needs to be looked at. So in this, you have a complete B-mode evaluation again. Just simple B-mode is good enough. Apply a tourniquet to the upper arm, preferably done in sitting position if your patient is fit enough to sit. Trace the vein from wrist to the arm. Must be superficial from the skin surface. Assess B-mode compressibility. It's an echoic lumen that is you'll rule out thrombosis just by simple compression. Diameter, an ideal diameter by the AIOM guidelines is 2.5 millimeter or more and look for adjoining venous tributaries which could need ligation. So let's look at all this in the next few slides. So you have your superficial and deep venous anatomy of the upper extremity here. You have your cephalic vein formed by the rich venous plexus coming on from the dorsum of your hand. The cephalic vein goes uh, cranially as a single trunk and may communicate with the medial basilic vein via median anterior vein. You can have a lot of anatomic variants in this. Then the cephalic vein traverses cranially through the arm and drains into the axillary vein or the subclavian vein by piercing the clavipectoral fascia when it enters the subclavian vein. And of course, you know the subclavian and the IJV together join on to form what is known as the innominate or the brachiocephalic vein. So this anatomy one should be well versed with before you start off the study. So again here, this is, uh, you take ample gel, you have a nice bath of gel there, so you're not applying any compression so as to assess the exact diameter without any mechanical compression of your transducer. You take the anterior posterior diameter and B-mode, and that's how you actually assess the cephalic vein. The color Doppler image is really not required, but you can just I mean, documented for that fancy look of your film. So uh, this is an example on the uh, left side of my screen, wherein you have a cephalic vein, which is showing a very rugged, irregular kind of a wall. So if there is thrombocebitis out there, here the vein is just thrombosed. There's no flow. I mean, this is not going to expect flow. It is non-compressible. And of course, you know that the vascular surgeon is not going to have surprises when he really takes an incision there. You know the vein is thrombosed. So 
uh, Doppler prior to all these surgeries always, always help. Again, the distance from the skin, once measured, it should be ideally less or equal to six millimeter. Here is a distance of almost five millimeter, which is optimum. So again, just to summarize, look for lumen, wall thickening, thrombosis, diameter, then entirely the vein should be traced for patency and diameter. Must be superficial enough for easy access. Any large branches need to be noted because you know if the large branches are kept as they are, say the fistula maturation can be hampered because you have too many vessels, you know, taking up the blood flow. It, it gets distributed and does not go to one channel, which is needed for a uh, successful mature AV fistula. Then basilic vein is examined in case the cephalic vein is not optimal. So let's go to the actual some B more videos I have. So you actually look at the cephalic vein in B more without any much compression. So here you can see you just saw a tributary going there. So make note of those tributaries because they may need ligation. And look for any obvious venous wall thickening along its course. Look for uniformity of the lumen, compress it in between and rule out any uh, obvious thrombosis. Then place it as high as you can. So we had begun in the forearm. Now I go on to the arm and then I go on higher up cranially. And I actually demonstrate the uh, entry into the subclavian vein. So that if that if you can demonstrate that, nothing like it, because then you have traced the entire cephalic vein to uh, right to its, uh, uh, to its confluence with the subclavian vein. Okay, so after you assess the superficial veins, now it's time for assessment of the deep vein. You have your IJV and your subclavian, very important to assess. Also have a quick look at the axillary if possible. Assess them for venous patency. So you actually switch on color and you can see a beautiful color flow there. And you have to have to document the uh, waveforms because these waveforms tell you that uh, tell you or give you a lot of information. Now look here, you have your IJV and your subclavian classic pulsatile pattern is because of transmitted cardiac pulsatility from your right atrium and you also have a respiratory phasicity so these veins are respirophasic in the sense respiration inspiration and ex expiration affects these veins venous waveforms and during inspiration you can see a larger peak there because during inspiration you have negative intrathoracic pressure and more of blood is sucked into the thorax and hence, you have this deeper uh, wave going in during inspiration where you have a smaller wave during expiration. So this is a typical respirophasic waveform of which the subclavian and the internal jugular vein shows. And this is also a mirror of your central veins because once you see the, this cardiac, transmitted cardiac pulsatility and phasicity, you rule out innominate or brachiocephalic vein thrombosis. So it's a wonderful indirect Doppler sign for your central vein. So now summing up, my entire pre-operative evaluation, I had some studies, Wong et al., Silva et al., telling you an optimum diameter of the radial artery and the cephalic vein. So these studies have published that 1.6 millimeter is the optimum size, 1.6 or more for the radial artery. Uh, some studies say 2 millimeter or more for the cephalic vein, uh, 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 for 2.5 millimeter or more for the cephalic vein. But believe me, in the Indians, especially in females, you have smaller venous sizes. And a two millimeter vein should be optimum enough to, uh, I mean, give a green signal for construction of the fistula. So to sum up the preoperative evaluation, this is the uh, Doppler format in which you actually enumerate everything, right, from brachial artery, how it is bifurcating, the level of bifurcation. You also tell about the uh, anatomic variance out there, if any. Then you write down about your brachial, radial, ulnar arteries, their pattern of flow, the luminal diameter. You also comment about the reactive hyperemia and the modified Allen test. And once all this is established, fulfilled, you can always write down there that arterial evaluation of the radial artery reveals it to be a suitable artery for a feeder artery. Then, of course, venous evaluation, you have to trace the cephalic vein right from the wrist into the forearm and arm. Then uh, write down about its compressibility. There's no wall thickening. Write down, uh, make, a ta make a table, write down the sizes in millimeter, right in the mid forearm, proximal forearm and arm. And then if you really have um, 
no clue if the cephalic vein is thrombosed or thickened and go to the basilic vein because surgeons also do prefer doing a basilic vein transposition or a brachiobasilic basilic fistula in case the cephalic vein is not optimum uh, so then basilic vein can be evaluated again for a thrombus again for the entire course its anatomy and depth in the skin surface so after you have done all this evaluate the deep veins for their uh, spasticity and pulsatility as i just described in the previous slides and then give you give your impression and you can also draw a diagram there and actually describe where you or actually mark the site where you are suggesting uh, the vascular surgeon to construct a fistula so this was the pre operative evaluation now let's go actually to maturation of a fistula and post operative evaluation so once a fistula is created by a vascular surgeon uh, it takes around 4 to 6 weeks for the fistula to mature and the fistula is said to be mature when the venous diameter exceeds 6 mm and the volume flow measurements are about 600 ml per second you can remember this rule of 6 so 6 mm uh the venous diameter size and the measurements of volume flow about 600 ml per second so if both these criteria are met more than 95% of the avf can be used for hemodialysis successfully then the outflow vein depth of uh, less than or 6 mm is always welcomed Uh, below the skin surface maturation is likely if blood flow through the fistula is 250 to 500 ml per minute on post operative day 1 and 500 to 900 ml per minute one month after the construction of the anastomosis so these are all cited from this article uh, in radiology 2002 by ml robin and any shambleden it's a very nice article and it takes around 4 to 6 weeks for maturation of a fistula so um in a post operative evaluation or in a avf avf evaluation we must know what is normal and what is abnormal and when are these patients going to come to you if the thrill is palpable nicely the vascular surgeon is clinically good enough and is not going to require any doppler but what are the conditions really when they really suspect something is going wrong and send it to you so obviously any swelling around the site of anastomosis no palpable thrill or you know the uh, the technologist is not able to puncture the hd access site when the patient goes on in for a fistula after maturation uh, goes on in for a dialysis after ad adequate maturation so all these are certain clinical scenarios where the patient with a uh, post op hd access fistula patient will be sent to you for a doppler evaluation so okay. so how do you go step by step evaluating the fistula first is you look at the feeder artery then you look obviously at the anastomosis you look at the draining vein we'll see how this is done then you look at the volume flow measurement then you look at the deep vein evaluation as i already described you look both on b mode and color doppler and then lastly you assess the flow to the hand and rule out any possible steel phenomena so let's go one by one and let's sort this out well now so you have this inflow artery which is coming which is your feeder artery now you have uh, completely um, completely changed the hemodynamics of the upper extremity by connecting a vein directly to the artery bypassing the capillary circulation altogether so the inflow artery which was earlier supplying to a vascular bed of small small capillaries with high peripheral resistance suddenly the peripheral resistance is goes off and you have a large venous channel accepting the same blood flow and hence when your blood flow is diverted all into this outflow vein which is going to flow cranially to the heart what is going to happen to your distal artery is important so once you have a complete change in direction that is from your inflow artery to your vein what is happening distally is important and this distal segment is where you look for any reversal because that can tell you about distal arterial steel so inflow artery draining vein and your distal runoff so your distal arterial resistance is also very important in deciding whether your patient is going to land up with a, uh, with a uh, symptomatic steel or not risk for avia failure include female sex older age group and patients with other vascular comorbidities like a patient already having calcified vesicles and so on now volume flow so a lot of confusion is there about where the exactly volume flow should be measured so the, I, the literature says ideally the volume flow must be measured 10 cm cranial to the site of anastomosis 
here in veins in the upper extremity i would prefer to use the word cranial and caudal instead of proximal and distal that creates confusion there are uh, many articles stating the word downstream upstream but i myself prefer to use the word cranial and caudal because it's simple to understand so your volume flow measurements we'll see how to do them the machine gives them you really don't need to uh, really mug up the formula or do any calculations yourself so it's always prudent once you look at the fistula to first document a good b more still image now here is your ulnar artery here is your anastomosis and here is your draining vein so this is a beautiful representation on b more of all the three vessels your feeder artery your anastomosis and your draining vein and this is the distal artery which is taking off next i mean which is going to supply the hand so all this is all documentation of all this is very important on b mode itself so let's look at this actual uh, dynamic clip on b mode so i am now following this artery uh, we go we'll have a look again so this is the artery with its venic comitans is the brachial artery it's it's bifurcating into radial into radial and ulnar and here you can see a nice anastomosis there between the draining vein and the artery which tells you that this anastomosis is nice and open and gives you a lot of information on b mode itself without switching on color doppler so it's very very important to first do a b mode assessment of the sd axis i go again so you have this artery bifurcating and then you have the artery and venous anastomosis out here so now you have once you have frozen the image you have a nice depiction of the anastomosis this is your arterial end and this is your venous end fine so what are the, now once you have identified the feeder artery the draining vein what do you do you have to sample the feeder artery ideally 2 cm cranial to your anastomosis and then you will find a monophasic waveform why because now your distal arterial resistance is very low you are your your artery is directly supplying a large venous channel and hence it's very very uh, obvious that this vessel is going to become a radial artery pre anastomosis or cranial to the anastomosis is going to become a monophasic bed and this is a very good sign once you see this in the feeder artery it tells you that your feeder artery is that tells you it's an indirect sign that your hemodialysis axis is patent then going on to your draining vein again the draining vein shows an arterialized pattern of flow and you measure the volume flow somewhere 10 cm uh, cranial to the anastomosis along the mid draining vein and here you can see a volume flow of 1893 ml per minute is recorded so you have your time average mean velocity calculated by the machine you just have to measure at the site of sampling the vessel diameter and the machine gives you a ready uh, value of your volume flow so what are the various complications you will come across a very common complication is thrombosis followed by stenosis peri avf collection aneurysmal dilatation pseudo aneurysm deep venous thrombosis in which you get a swollen upper limb let's look at those conditions as well and the steel phenomenon so here is a completely thrombosed draining vein very very obvious it's completely filled distended lumen completely filled with uh, thrombus no still palpated and hence you know the entire draining vein is thrombosed and such a thrombus is uh, definitely a bit difficult to salvage here is a thrombus sitting at the anastomotic site so you have the artery here the anastomosis is completely thrombosed then stenosis so here is a very important part of the lecture so how do you how do you really assess the stenosis and how do you say that it is significant so b mode b mode b mode just looking at the b mode itself you get an idea that is there stenosis or not and after you have a b mode evaluation then you confirm the same with a doppler waveform assessment so look for visual b mode stenosis assess in the transverse plane with least transducer pressure significant stenosis is defined as luminal narrowing equal to or exceeding 50% compared with the vascular segment situated upstream or caudally from the stenosis and increased peak systolic velocity at the stenosis site 
the ratio is 3 is to 1 for anastomosis and 2 is to 1 for draining vein. So, for those of you who have not understood this slide, let me explain it in a schematic pictorial diagram. So, here is your feeder artery, here is your anastomosis and here is your draining vein. So, your flow is going to be in the cranial direction towards the heart when you construct a fistula. So now suppose you have a draining vein stenosis happening here say due to intimal proliferation. What you do is you measure the velocity just caudal to it which is say x and when you measure the velocity at the stenosis if it is 2x and if it is twice that of x then you can say that this, this stenosis is significant. It is hemodynamically significant and may need a vascular intervention. Now, what is the criteria for anastomotic stenosis? So, you have the feeder artery here, you have the anastomosis here and you have the draining vein here. So, if you are suspecting uh, anastomotic narrowing on B mode and when you switch on color and you take the waveform, the velocity here in the artery, the feeder artery, just 2 centimeters cranial to the anastomosis be compared with the velocity at the anastomosis with your correct Doppler angle correction. If it is 3 times that of your feeder artery, then it indicates an anastomotic narrowing. So it is 2 is to 1 for your draining vein and 3 is to 1 for your anastomosis. So I think this schematic diagram makes it very clear as to how and where you are going to sample. So here's an example of a normal AV fistula. This is the feeder artery, which is showing a good monophasic flow sampled two centimeters cranial to the anastomosis. It's a nice monophasic flow with a peak systolic velocity of 170 centimeters per second. And then when I go on to the anastomosis actual and I sample it, it's around 333, which is which is absolutely no stenosis because three is three three times is the criteria for stenosis. So if it was 500 and above, I would have thought of uh, having this called a uh, anastomotic uh, narrowing. So this is all about a normal fistula, so feeder artery anastomosis. This flow is absolutely fine. Now here's an example of actual anastomotic stenosis where your velocities are going much much beyond, you know, hitting almost seven meters per second there, and this is truly a very alias flow there with evidence of anastomotic stenosis. Now here's an example of draining vein stenosis. You have the uh, draining vein right here and you can see that it is visually on B mode itself it, you can see that it's, there is some intimal proliferation and some reduction in its diameter and yes the velocities are high with aliasing and this, all, this tells you that this is a, a stenosed draining vein. So let's look at this actually on a B mode video. So you can see the vessel wall calcification there, the artery, the feeder artery. That's your uh, anastomosis there. And then you trace the vein, trace the vein, and on B mode assess it. And you can obviously see that there is stenosis. So just let's just carefully see this real time clip. So now I'm opening up the entire draining vein there. And I obviously see that the draining vein is narrow there and there is obvious anastomo there is obvious intimal thickening there. So intimal thickening because of repeated punctures is the commonest cause, etiopathogenesis of draining vein stenosis. Yeah, so same thing. Here's the anastomosis and here's your uh, which is quite open and good. And as you trace the draining vein, you can see that there is more than 50% diameter reduction and you have a properly stenosed draining vein. Again, same thing on Doppler, you have aliasing of color flow. You have some intimal proliferation here which is not filling up, so definitely this is some wall thickening and then you have this very high velocities at the site of narrowing. Again, same thing, draining vein stenosis. So here you can see that there is wall thickening and intimal proliferation uh, in the venous wall, which is leading to the venous, venous stenosis. Now, um, recently I came across, that's why I included these slides, very rare find, but I, I did find one thrombosis of the feeder artery in one individual who had come in for a SG axis Doppler evaluation. Uh, so, the entire radial artery was thrombosed, very sad. And here you can see that the thrombus is here and the patent lumen, the, the flow, the RBCs are actually hitting this thrombus actually thumping against this thrombus and this is the uh, 
etiopathogenesis of as to why we get this typical pre occlusive hump so you can actually demonstrate it right here so this was a thrombose artery fetal artery very rare to find but yes i did come across uh, one of these cases uh, in the recent past then perivenous selections are not very uncommon this is a draining vein uh, perivenous selection may be uh, in the immediate post op period leading to a clinical swelling and then sent to you for an evaluation is also very common then aneurysmal dilatation uh, it's not very uncommon to find these kind of you know swollen uh, venous channel uh, all along the forearm in cases of repeated punctures and these patients who undergo uh, hemodialysis so here you have this cephalic vein very much dilated to a diameter of 17 mm so entire diffuse uh, aneurysmal dilatation is seen and the etiopathogenesis is repeated punctures which leads to multiple fibrous scars along the venous wall which lead to aneurysmal dilatation and high these high flow states in the vein further cause intimal damage uh, intimal damage and this becomes a vicious cycle so uh, this is very commonly seen in those who are undergoing you know long standing uh, hemodialysis and care must be taken by the technologists in these cases because these punctures can leave uh, the patient with life threatening complications of large amount of hemorrhage then coming on to pseudo aneurysm there you typically see that yin yang flow in the pseudo aneurysm so this is also not very uncommon you do find them uh, as a complication of av fistula construction then uh, this is one good illustration where you must assess the entire draining vein right up to its confluence with the subclavian vein now this is a case of a swollen vein limb well fistula is like quite patent hemodialysis is happening but the vein is but the limb is persistently swollen and it was found that there was a high grade stenosis at the confluence of the sub, uh, the cephalic vein and the subclavian vein right high in your uh, supraclavicular region so this assessment is also very important especially in swollen limbs you must assess the entire vein right from the forearm anastomosis to its uh, end or to its confluence into the deep vein so here you can if a catheter angio is beautifully showing the same let come on to coming on to arterial seal now here you can see retrograde anti grade flow during systole and retrograde flow during diastole when you sample the distal radial artery that is artery which is at the wrist or it is at it is a, a caudal to the anastomosis so here you can actually see proper reversal because um yes so this is typical typical pattern of uh, vascular reversal vascular flow reversal there so how do you prove it you gently compress on the venous side of the avf and this leads to establishment of anti grade flow so once you have compressed the venous side and you have like you know occluded the side channeling of that flow into the fistula your flow distally improves and hence you get anti grade flow or establishment of your anti grade forward flow towards the hand and this is kind of a, a proof that you have arterial seal happening there so what are the stages stage 1 is retrograde diastolic flow without complaints uh, that is a seal phenomenon which is completely asymptomatic in stage 2 you start getting pain on exertion and or during hemodialysis so always ask the history that do you get any pain any tingling numbness happening during the hcr during the hd or during the hemodialysis at the center or you just uh, get rest pain so stage 3 is rest pain and stage 4 is ulceration or necrosis or gangrene so when there is rest, when there is rest pain itself you may have to salvage the fistula or sacrifice it to establish good uh, flow to the hand otherwise the hand will undergo real ischemia and this is where your importance of assessing the palmar arch which i told which i said or stressed upon in the pre op evaluation is very very important so once you have a patent palmar arch the ulnar artery takes care and your hand limb ischemia is prevented or your finger ischemia is prevented now coming to av grafts actually i am in uh, today i mean in my practice i hardly hardly ever see av grafts i've not seen one for the last couple of years solely because native fistulas do very well they have very less rates of complications and very very uh, suitable for patients very uh, they, they really last long uh, av grafts have their own complications they are more expensive but we just need to know about a few simple things about them now they are synthetic grafts made up of ptfe 
there, there could be forearm loop grafts or upper arm straight grafts and loop grafts. So you have uh, the uh, you have a straight graft there which is connecting the radial artery to the cubital vein there, and you have a loop graft which is connecting which is like a loop connecting the brachial artery to the cubital vein there. <coughs> And this is your native fistula. So a native fistula is always much better, much affordable, uh, very patient friendly. So again, the same complications can happen in grafts. I have a few slides to show. So here's a graft pseudoaneurysm happening there uh, as a complication of uh, putting the graft there. You can also have graft thrombosis happening similar to your uh, draining vein thrombosis. And this is another example, catheter angio also done, wherein you're having these pseudoaneurysms happening all along the graft. So one must be aware of these complications happening in the graft. And also look at graft thrombosis, stenosis, and so on. So AV fistula native versus graft. Natives are always preferred. Long lasting, higher patency, less infection and complications, and of course cost in a country like India where cost is an important factor. So native fistulas are always, always preferred. So to sum up uh, a Doppler report, how you would report a SG axis fistula reporting format. So you first mentioned about a proper BMO done right from your uh, feeder artery, your anastomosis, and your draining vein. You describe it in this format. So write down about the anastomosis, write down about the peak systolic velocity of the anastomosis, write down about the draining vein caliber, uh, whether it shows arterialized flow or not, with a uh, peak systolic velocity of how much, and of course the volume flow has to be has to be mentioned. Uh, state about the draining vein right up to its confluence with the subclavian vein. Talk about the distal artery, this uh, radial artery distally to rule out any steel. This must be must be a part of your Doppler report. And then obviously you will write about the deep veins, both the IJV and the subclavians, to conclude your report. And then whether mention your abnormalities, which are you picked up, or if it's not, then of course you call it a functioning AVF. So to conclude, preoperative evaluation and mapping is very, very important. It's extremely useful to choose a site and its team work with a vascular surgeon. Postoperative AVF, ultrasound, and color Doppler is the established modality to assess the function and its complications of a hemodialysis access, which is a lifeline for your CRF patients. So thank you for a very patient attention there, and I hope I have covered uh, almost all the points. Thank you so much ma for that comprehensive lecture on a difficult topic and a great one, as you said. Uh, we had a wonderful audience of more than 400 participants from, from close to mm -hmm. uh, 38 countries, uh, and there are more than questions already in the q and a okay okay so we can take them one by one chinmay i think uh, should i put across or you would like to choose yeah you can just put across i am reading but you can just put across where i will miss any and we can start okay so we start uh, do we need i think you mentioned them but what measurements do we need to give in pre op assessment of the visuals yeah, so in the measurements for preoperative uh, evaluation, you would need to mention the diameter of the radial artery. You need to mention the diameters of the cephalic, of whichever vein you are choosing, maybe cephalic, maybe basilic, right uh, along its course, whether the course is uniform or not. You need to mention the, the diameters of the cephalic vein at the distal forearm, the mid forearm, proximal forearm, and the arm. The next question is, to assess volume flow and Doppler? Yes. So uh, for volume flow, what you do is, you for a, a normal functioning AVF, what you do is, you go around 10 centimeters cranial to the anastomosis, sample the draining vein. Now, the volume flow has to be given in a draining vein. So sample the draining vein, then have your machine settings, uh, call your application person, and have your volume flow setting in the machine right visible there. You click on that and then you it gives you, it tells you to take a trace of say two or three cardiac cycles. You trace it carefully on your own and then after you've traced it, it gives you a time average mean velocity. After that appears, you take your calipers and measure your luminal diameter at the site of sampling. 
and low your volume flow appears it's not rocket science it's just simple even even if you do it uh, i mean some machines are like auto you just have auto trace and you just take the measurement manually the measurement has to be done by you by the way so at at the site of sampling you measure the vessel vessel luminal diameter and your volume flow appears right on the screen it is it, uh, the calculation is done by the machine you don't have to do anything much
caudally, caudal to anastomosis, you you need to get a normal forward flow. That is, you should see flow something like this above the baseline. Whereas here, I am seeing a completely sawtooth kind of a pattern where you have anti a small little anti-grade flow during systole there and complete retrograde flow during diastole throughout the cardiac cycle. So there is hardly anything going in the anti-grade direction. So am I clear? So my radial artery basically is not getting good flow because proximally or cranially you have diverted that entire flow to the vein to facilitate dialysis. So my radial artery down at the wrist is not getting flow because you have diverted the channel. Pani sahi aur chala gaya hai, niche pani nahi aa raha. It's like that. You you have a big pipeline and then you attach four pipelines to it. The main pipeline uh, in the uh, in its uh, course after you have uh, diverted the water is not going to get enough water. It's similar. So you have this typical waveform coming in where you have steel and then just you compress on the venous side to I mean just to Stop that diversion of flow, and once you stop that diversion of flow, you start getting a beautiful anti-grade flow establishing on the radial distal radial artery. So this is what happens in the steel phenomenon. It may be completely asymptomatic for patients. Those who are slightly symptomatic may tell you that during the hemodialysis, I start getting numbness, I start getting pain. So uh, this is the way to understand steel. Uh, I hope I'm clear. Let me keep the presentation and share it. Okay, yes. Oh, yeah, sure. Will there be any change of IVG and IVJ and subclavian septal pattern? Can you go again? In patients with EV fistula, will there be any change in IJV and subclavian septal pattern? No. Uh, we often see narrowing of mid forearm cephalic vein, uh, even though the cephalic vein is normal. So, such narrowing is contraindication, or is there any criteria? No, there is no criteria. It's basically eyeballing to see that you have a fairly uniform caliber. You know, so uh, the caliber should not drop from like you know ten. If it's a good two millimeter vein, it should not become suddenly one millimeter as you trace it proximally. So, it should be around two millimeter. You know, one point eight one. And what is uh, there, there is one thing you observe that as you actually go cranially, the cephalic vein diameter in fact improves. In your arm, you're going to have definitely have a diameter of three millimeter if you have a two millimeter diameter in your uh, forearm, unless and until the patient is very frail, very thin, dehydrated. Mind well, hydration also causes a lot of changes in the venous wall in the venous diameter. The next question is with respect to uh, the muscles of the fistula. Yes. Yeah, what diagram, uh, at what diameter should we call it as aneurysmal dilatation? And um, can you also? Uh, yes, yes. Okay. So, at what diameter? Generally, if the diameter starts exceeding eight to nine millimeter, it starts going on to aneurysmal dilatation. Okay, ma'am. And uh, can you explain again the anastomosis vein diagram and velocity? Yes, certainly. Uh, the concept here is clear that you have a feed the artery here, you have an anastomosis, and you have a draining vein. So, where do you sample? Now, suppose on the B mode, I see a draining uh, vein stenosis on B mode out here, that is, I see a luminal diameter reduction. What I do is I sample that area of reduction and I note the peak systolic velocity there, and then I sample just a few uh, millimeter or a few centimeter uh, or maybe a uh, just a centimeter caudal to it. Am I clear? So this is, let's see, this is caudal, this is cranial. So once you have the anastomosis and once you have the draining vein, this is going to go cranial and this is going to go caudal. So if I see a stenosis here, just sample immediately caudal and check for the ratio. So if you have a gradient of more than 2 is to 1, that is if you have velocities here twice as that as you see here, then you call it a hemodynamically significant draining vein stenosis. And for the anastomosis, you have the feeder artery here, you have the anastomosis here. So just 2 centimeter uh, for cranial to the anastomosis when you have sampled the feeder artery, 
to take the velocity as x and if at the anastomosis you are seeing any visual be more stenosis and there you sample it with good angle correction if it is three times that of this that of the feeding of feeder artery then it it tells you that it is uh, drain, it is anastomotic stenosis so it's three is to one for anastomosis and two is to one for the draining vein I hope I'm clear. Yes, ma'am. Uh, the next question is about tying the tourniquet before venous examination. So do we apply? Yes. Yes, you. It's it's good to apply a light tourniquet. Not too tight. A light tourniquet helps to distend the vein better. And uh, should we give skin to radial artery and cephalic vein distance and distance? You radial. can give it. You can give it at the site where you want to have the actual construction at the site. What are the chances of closure every year? Chances of? Fistula closure, closure every year. Uh, closure? I didn't get the question. It's a pandemic, correct. Uh, what are the uh, accepted maximum and minimum volume flow of blood? Yes, yes. So volume flow up to around uh, 800, 900 ml or 1000 is acceptable. When it starts going about above 1100, 1200, 1500, it becomes a high volume fistula. But that's very commonly, you commonly get such high volume fistulas. And when you have a good cardiac reserve, they hardly ever lead to any problem. But then when you start getting very high volume fistulas, above 1800, 2000, then, you know, uh, the patient may land up into cardiac failure. To say it's a high volume fistula, dilated draining vein is a sign of high volume fistula. Yeah, I just told you high volume fistula is anything above 1000, 1200, and uh, an optimum fistula is 600 to 1200. That's ideal. So I just I just describe what a high volume fistula is. The next is should we give brachial artery diameter also in all cases? Not needed, not needed. How do you correct angle for PEP systolic velocity measurement, especially when vessels are longitudinal in origin or radiation? Go again. Uh, how do we correct angle for the PSP measurement? It's uh, angle should be along the vessel. I mean, it's it's it, this is now now this is basic Doppler. I can't really teach you that here on on an online show. Um, mm -hmm. I think that's about it. Uh, this is the last. The request is can you share the website which you mentioned um, for this? Yes, it's the AIUM website, it's the AIUM guidelines. So just type AIUM guidelines for AV fistula on uh, Google and you get everything. Uh, perfect, man. Thank you so much yes. for giving me your yes. time. Yes. And anything more, I mean, any questions more, any formats you need, just feel free. I can, you know, share it on email and then you can share it to the delegates. Yes, and we have had uh, wonderful feedback and they want more from you on this platform. So as Thank you uh, so much. It was lovely to have you again on this uh, symposium. And uh, we hope to hear more from you on interesting other compounds in the future. So, uh, do Thank the you. Uh, do join us for the uh, radiology review, fairness review report over the next two weekends. We won't be having Kakarangan sessions on 25th and 26th February, that's a Saturday and Sunday, and also on 2nd and 3rd. But we'll be having one session on the next Wednesday, that's the 28th of February. Uh, that's it. I'll end the webinar here and uh, hope to show you yes. another great TV time. Thank you. Yes, Chinmay, thank you very much. This is a topic very close to my heart. So, any questions, please you know, email them to me. If, you know, time is a constraint to answer all. So, I'll be happy to help. Uh, Sean, can you just uh, type out your email ID? Uh, yes, that? I'll do it here for everyone. It's in small, it's in the webinar chat. There you go. Lovely, ma'am. Thank you so much for being so generous. And I'm sure you will get a full of the PS meeting. Please thank you. Thank you, Chinmay. Hope you have a great evening. Thank you. Have a, have a great evening. Uh, thank you. Bye. We'll just end the webinar here. And uh, yep. see you over the next session. Recordings.